Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Muscle Minds with Dr. Scott Stevenson. I'm Scott McNally. Our programming is brought to you by truenutrition.com, and we're also brought to you by getazoff.com. Dr. Scott, uh, we talked about this beforehand. We were going to talk a little bit about how, how should we even put this? Like, I guess intense training techniques. Old, old, old school, like lost training concepts, actually, to some degree. I like the sound of that. Yeah. yeah. I rediscovered Mike Mensor. This, uh, <laughs> well, I knew who he was. I was familiar with his physique. I was familiar with you know, some of his, like, the politics around him. Uh, in in competitive bodybuilding, I obviously knew what heavy duty was, but I had never really followed him closely. And Scott, I started watching his videos, which the amazing soundtracks, first of all. Uh, but his videos, early '80s. You're gonna rip those for your training, aren't you? I, I am. Actually, we're gonna we can use that for our intro music for this episode. Hell yeah! Um, that stuff, man. There's a lot of aspects of it that's very similar to stuff that I'm currently doing, like the stuff that's making the most sense to me. And what I'm currently doing has kind of been like a bastardization of adopting things I've learned listening to you. You call me a bastard? Is that what I got from that? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's all I got. You call me a bastard in the gym. Like Scott made me do this shit, but it works. So fucking bastard. Um, yeah. So the thing, the thing you gotta, we gotta think about with with um, heavy duty training and Mike Mentzer is he had an evolution. So he he was um, with uh, the founder of Nautilus. What's his name? Um, he sort of kind of uh, I'm blanking Arthur on Jones. his name. Right now. Arthur Jones. Yeah. So I've gone deep, Scott. Or, I've gone deep. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we're going back, back in time. So that was sort of some of the connection there and the idea. It, it's, been, it's been compared to DC training in the yeah, past. Yeah, I can see that. You know, um, And the, the relevance of the comparisons are kind of a function of w which version of Mike Mentzer, because um, he sort of, he went a little bit overboard near the end. And I don't know if, you've, if you saw that when you're digging into him. Not yet. At all. Not yet. Like he got, and, and I. It's been so long since I went and looked this up, but and there are still acolytes, people who follow his, his ways, and who do this. I think, like taking this, but he got to the like, the idea that you know you want to have the most intense stimulus possible, and make sure you absolutely utterly maximize your recovery. So it was like it got to be like one set a month, or something like <laughs> wow. that. Wow! Wow! Yeah, it was literally. At one point in time, and I think some of that was near the end of his days, okay. where I heard, you know, there was there was just rumors that he wasn't all that well uh, physically or mentally. So he may have been trying to like figure out kind of a hook, you know, kind of a spiel. Yeah, okay. For people. Like, and that's a great thing. So yeah, you go in the gym, you train three times a month, and you, you get bigger than ever, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing about the thing about that, which I think happened to a lot of people is you take someone who had been frustrated because they're trying to like literally do what Arnold did follow Arnold's magazine routines yeah. it's way too much and they tend to train too hard and all of a sudden they deload and they get a rebound while they're doing heavy duty training or HIT or whichever uh, version and they grow like weeds yeah it's like okay that's awesome so that this is the way to go but it really wasn't so much it was just the fact that they stopped overreaching or, or literally over tanking mm. and but went to a better system so the thing that um, that's interesting about all like his he didn't this is what was also very uh, enticing to people so he was a big um, proponent of sort of the notions of Ayn Rand a y n r a n d okay yeah uh, Atlas shrugged you can Google all this stuff and so he was like he didn't he didn't think he didn't read any of the Western scientific literature, huh. as far as I know. Maybe he did, and he just didn't talk about it and want to admit it. But he never references anything about, you know, like Brad. This was long before after he passed. Like you know, Brad Schoenfeld's article about what are the you know stimuli for muscle hypertrophy, and yeah. he didn't really talk about it from that. He just talked about it from the logical perspective that he derived in the trenches. Yes. Yeah, I and, can see that. And it was always like he'd write these articles for like muscular development or flex magazine. I think like I you know, read them in the old school magazines and he's just, he's just waxing poetic, you know, all about like, this is, this is the way that would make the most sense. And then talking about how people sort of 
They're not. They're no longer thinking in a logical way when they do this thing. Blah blah blah. And it was all just sort of a logical perspective on this is the way to grow. Okay. And what kind of scene with his clients. Hmm. So, but it was very well. It was very um, sort of esoteric, and um, you know, a lot of long convoluted sentences along the ways that many philosophers will write. So it was attract. It was attractive to someone of an intellectual um, huh. Huh. density. You know, it's like, ah, yeah, I like, kind of like this. Like what he's it's sort of saying makes sense. It's, it's a, a thinking man's type of perspective on it all. Yeah. So, and it works for lots of people. Yeah. It does. Yeah. As long as you don't like it. What are you talking about at the end? Like, it's not going to work. But, um, and it's, and it's like you take the people who's really, who are really, really motivated and they turn that motivation in, in the gym mm -hmm. and train really, really hard. Mm -hmm. And that matches with, Progressive overload, DC training, fortitude training, numerous other systems that are based on that basic principle. That makes where sense. You train as hard as you can. You like harness that essential quality of resistance exercise. Yeah. That is that it's so effortful and there's so much tension that it's extraordinary and your body adapts. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, so that's kind of like that's the, the HIT thing, but there are the people who still follow it. They're like, they just, it's, it's a tribal type of thing. Really. Interesting. I could to see that. Degree, a lot of them are like, they really are, there's not as nearly as many, they're not as vocal as they used to be, but it was like, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. This is the way that, this is the way everyone should train. You know, there's only one way, that sort of thing. I, well, I'll tell you what, I mean, uh, I could kind of say there was a time when people who followed DC might've been that way too. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's not um, unlike DC then in that way. Well, yeah, it was, um, some people would go overboard that way. Okay. In a way. And if you know, if you follow Dante, especially at the end, like he was, he got part of why he got so burnt out was he was constantly having that sort of, um, def felt like he was, he was defending himself. People uh. would like call him and, and he'd get into these long online arguments about various things. That'll burn anybody out. Yeah, of course. And he, and he took it like just his personality was like, you're not going to poke me and have me not poke you back. Mm, yeah. um, there was a guy and this came up in a podcast I did a couple of days ago. His name was Scott something. I can't remember his last name. And he was like, he knew everything that Dante had, had written basically. Okay. And it wasn't like a giant guy or like that. He just was a believer in the principles and he used to go, he would, he would basically Anywhere that someone had said something about DC training on the T Nation boards, there's an article. There's actually an interview with him yeah. over there, and any other discussion board, he would he would take the information that Dante had written, or he would explain things for people. Okay, kind of kind of took the, you know, took the fire, took the past the torch was sort of passed on to him, and okay. Dante was totally cool with it. He was dead on with everything. That's cool. Yeah, and then he sort of vanished. Yeah, I don't know what happened to him. His okay. name was Scott, and I can't remember. Last name, but so he's not doing it anymore. I was gonna say if he was still doing it, we could find him just by making a post somewhere and asking a DC, saying something stupid about DC, and he'd yeah, show up. Yeah, but apparently, that's not gonna happen yeah. anymore. Yeah, we could bait him out, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. His, his last initial was an M too, because he's they call him SM oh, on not me. the T Nation. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. That's the thing. Um, obviously, it wasn't you. Maybe, maybe it was. <laughs> I won't, I won't tell you. I won't. Yeah. I won't I'm not going to disclose either way. I'll tell you yeah. what. There was some. So here's what I saw. Yeah, tell it, me more about you. What you saw. Okay, this is what blew my mind. First of all, so having worked out with Shelby, which we've talked about a bunch of times, because that was a very formative experience for me. Shelby Starnes and a lot of his training was, you know, John Meadows' stuff at the time. It, it evolved, and he we did some Jordan Peter stuff toward the end, but. Uh, one of the things we really did was focus on like the, the 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 structure of a rep even, and it would be like a three second negative. And when I say three seconds, I mean you really count to four because it's only to, when right. you get to the fourth second, one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, and then when you hit four, that's the end of the rep. That's the end or of the third zero, second. Zero one two three, and that's the count. Of four. There you go. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so doing negatives like that, that was something I had never done before. And I found, especially like my hamstrings really sucked for a long time and doing a hundred pump sets didn't change that at all. But right. over a period of two years of really doing slow, slow negatives with them. And now, now I'm seeing Scott slow negatives are for me are a big answer for growth across the board. Like that's been a mm. big thing for me in this last six months to a year. Um, that's a big aspect of what but I you saw. You haven't gained any weight, have you, Scott? 
<laughs> Actually, I have. Yes. How much have you gained, by the way? Okay. So as of <laughs> and we talked about this on the other shows, but I, know. I, I misquoted myself or uh, I said 25 pounds. It's actually 35 pounds from a year ago this time. Granted, I was dieting a year ago this time, and I was at my lowest weight that I'd been to in a long time, but I haven't been at 222-ish. I haven't been this heavy uh, in uh, since about 2014, so I feel good. Maybe even 2013. Uh, and your leanest 222, your leanest absolutely. Most mass ever. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not pushing the food like crazy either, which last time I was at that weight, I was eating a lot of food. I was using injectable D ball plus, you know, DACA and everything like else. 15 pounds of water. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I was huffing. And I was trying to, like, right. just, I was passing out every time I tried to lean to put my seatbelt on, uh, you know, it, it, it tie my shoes. Now I'm, I'm comfortable. And man, I'm, I'm the strongest I've ever been, too. Uh, and it's like good quality strength. I'm not afraid of using, you know, it's not like, oh shit, I might tear something on this. I'm being very careful and cautious really wielding control over the weight. But so I'm, I'm employing a lot of this stuff that it's kind of just come together for me listening to, you know, having been taught by Shelby and listening to those things from John, having listened to John for years before that, John Meadows, uh, following his stuff online forever, and then meeting you and listening to the way you've talked about training and that my, my evolution has been down to like, you know, just a couple of sets. And I, another thing is, is he would, the, the work, the workouts I've seen like chest, he would warm up with like a pack deck. That would be like the first exercise. He would then superset that with an incline press. I'm not supersetting, but I am definitely doing that to pre-exhaust because I early on found pre-exhausting works well for me. So mm -hmm. that's something Menser does. So looking at these sets, it's, it's creepy to me because I'm putting these things together where I, you know, do my warm up as much as I need to, then get to like just some really difficult pack deck and then some really difficult incline press and then I'm done and that's it. And then I'm using the, trying to use these really slow negatives and stuff. And it's just like, man, all this stuff is lining up. I've known a Mike Mentzer. I've known what heavy duty was and I've known people who've listened to him and seen them train, but I didn't realize like how many similarities there was to his programming now. And I'm glad I'm glad you dug into that because this this is this is the course of human history. We keep on forgetting the things we the lessons we once learned. That's why we keep on having wars. Uh. We keep on like you think you have a war and like everyone almost gets you know exterminated in, a, in the two countries or multiple countries involved. Like World War One was just horrible. And then we have World War. We keep on fighting wars because we keep on seeming to forget that. Yeah, and history repeats itself. I told this story. I don't think he was here. I was on maybe. I was telling this to someone. There's a guy named David Bruce Dill, who was a, kind of a legend in the world of exercise physiology. He was at the Harvard Fatigue Lab. Okay. And he was one of the subjects when they start first were doing like VO2 max measurements. They have those measurements from when he was like 19 until like in his 90s. Wow. And he would go to like the American. Like I remember hearing these stories. He would go to the American College of Sports Medicine annual convention. And go to the expo hall where they have like all the poster presentations that the students would not, would do. Yeah. And he was just kind of a like the no people didn't know who he was because he's he's you know retired like 15, 20 years before that. But he's like the man. He's yeah. Done so much stuff, and he would just literally go from poster to poster and say, "Why are you doing that? Like, <laughs> don't you read the literature? We did that in '53. Yeah, yeah. All these pre medline studies, because people just keep doing the same thing. They just repeat it and. Those things that Mike Menser was doing, to some degree, people like they don't they don't know that was done before. So like yeah. someone else comes out with you know whatever su super high force training, and they they it's just basically just Menser reinvented. I saw a thing. Uh, someone uh, uh, tagged me on Instagram. She was doing a muscle round. Okay. And um and actually she was wasn't quite doing it the way I would have suggested. She wasn't resting. She was one. She was doing a dumbbell curls and she wasn't putting them down during the rest periods. Okay. So I helped her out, out with that. And someone else said, "Oh, I'm doing something like this." It's and he's talking about cluster sets. He's like, "It's called DC training. I'm not quite sure how many sets to do. Mm. Uh, it must be new. We'll see how it goes." And I'm yeah, like, okay. I'm like, I don't think it's going to go very well because you don't even know how many sets to do. Because he hasn't, <laughs> like, right? He hasn't gone, like, he hasn't gone to intense muscle. Yeah. Which has, you know, the largest, like, that's the original stuff that DC wrote. It's not an article that someone else put together on another board. Yeah. But he's, he, he's, he thinks it's brand new. It's like, it's, no, this isn't new. Well, new to you, maybe. Yeah. He, he, well, yeah, but like, and he's got fourteen. And this guy had like fourteen and a half thousand followers on Instagram. Oh wow. 
Wow. Yeah. So it wasn't like he was just sort of an anonymous guy who popped in. Like he's, you know, he's fitness model, something like that. Yeah. And so it was just interesting. Like that, that will continue to happen again and again and again and again. And some people take advantage of that because they uh, want to sell a novel approach. Yeah. To people. I could see that. Um, sure. But, but, but a lot of times it's, it's just like, you need to acknowledge those things. That's why like, Dante would acknowledge John Perillo when it came to extreme stretches. Yeah. And I acknowledge Dante in calling one of the stretch versions in my program, an extreme stretch I called it the same thing. Yeah. Rest pause is a Mike Menser technique. Okay. That's the terminology that he, he used. So he's that. the first one to invent that term. He's the one who, as far as I know, he's the one who came up with that term. And huh. it was like, literally you were, I think you were doing like singles, like for, for six with yeah. like, 20 or 30 reckon, seconds in between with like 95% of one rep max or Holy shit. something like that. It was very different than a DC training rest pause set. Okay. And this is before the term cluster set even kind of came about, I believe. Okay. But Dante, he saw that and he saw something usable with that. Just like I found muscle rounds by Leo Costa and found something usable from that. And I, I, I held onto the term. Yeah. So I, cause I wasn't trying to steal his intellectual property. I'm like, I'm going to, this is my version of a muscle round. Yeah. This is Dante's version of a rest pause set. Yeah. He, he acknowledged Perillo. I acknowledge Perillo and Dante, you know? So if, if people who don't do that, they're like, they're trying to say, sneaky, or, or they yeah. may not even know, they may not even mm. know what they're doing. Yeah. So yeah, like, like Menser and people used to always say, oh, DC training is just HIT. You know, yeah, no, it's, I can see it. I mean, I knew DC enough to see the differences now when I'm looking at like hit like high intensity that's different, heavy right, duty, yeah, it's it, different, it is, it is, but um, but it's got that same progressive overload, yeah, based. And if you if you don't see the nuances, if you haven't done both and dug into both, you would just lump them all, lump them together, huh. you know, yeah. I will say, like watching the video, that it was the video you just you had mentioned before we recorded, where he was in the gym with uh, what was the guy's name, Michael uh, Marcus Reinhardt. Yeah, Marcus, not, Re Marcus. Ch Ch great German name, but he made, obviously a German heritage, but he's an American. Yeah, he. Um, so they did. I, I I need to do a lot more warm ups than what he, and maybe that has to do with age. But what they showed in the video, uh, he was on a. a you know, I, they were they were the warm ups they did were not enough for me. That's for sure. I, yeah. I need a lot more than that. Uh, it was like four sets. You know, one yeah. very light, then one right. decently moderate, then one pretty heavy, and then just a couple of reps of something that was fairly very heavy. And then you're, How you're many ready. How would you need to do like six something? Maybe, maybe it like it depends. Uh -huh. I found that the heavier I go, if I'm gonna do. To make sure that everything's good and I'll do a lot of feeder sets. So if, you know, we've talked about before, like if I'm at like the 110 pound dumbbells on my incline presses, I'll start with the 50s and I'll do 8 to 10. Then I'll go to the 60s and I'll do 5. And I'll go to the 70s and I'll do 3. And I'll go to the 80s and I'll do 2 or 3. Then go to the 90s, yeah, and do, so I guess that's like 6. And then, yeah. and then I'll get right up there. And even, even if I don't feel a hundred percent, it's sometimes too, it's like that CNS thing that like mm -hmm. my, my body's not ready to handle the weight. And I might need to pick up if I'm doing one tens, I might need to pick up the hundreds and just do one or just do two. And right. then I'm ready, you know, but yeah. it does take me a lot. I found to be ready to yeah. be like that hundred percent ready to kill it. You know, I think it's psychological in your head. Okay. Cause you got a pattern, like, you know, some people, they always have to have the plates facing in, you know, yes. and, the, and the plates always need to be like, you know, if the, they're the place to interlock in some way, they have to be interlocked, you mm -hmm. know, we can't have anything. So like that has to be in place. Okay. They're rich, we're ritualistic, maybe OCD a little bit too, you know, no. a few times. us bodybuilders. <laughs> no, I can't. And then there's the neurological, like okay. literally it's a skill. And like, you, I know you've probably done this, but it happens with squats a good bit. Some of this could be related to um, uh, potentiation technique possibility in the muscle. But if you go and like warm your way up to like a heavy set of like six to eight, and then you drop back down to, you know, a set you're going to get for 10 to 12. If you did those in reverse order, even though you're fatigued when you do the, the lighter set la later, it just feels lighter. Yes, it does. After yeah. You've done the heavier set. Yeah. Yeah. Powerlifters do that all the, they do that. Like that's a typical, like guys will just go just, 
when they're on a day they're going to squat or maybe it's part of their training in some way, shape, or form. They'll like, let's say they're a 800 pound squatter, they'll just load a thousand pounds on mm, the bar, okay, and just unrack that shit and hold it, and just feel it, huh? Yeah, it's like just like they're not going to try to squat it because they get crushed. Huh. But like if you if you can un- unrack a thousand and hold it there, Whew. you know, and then put it back, well then the eight hundred feels light. I get that. Yeah, I totally. That's, yeah, that's a big part of yeah. it. Yeah, it's neurological and psychological because then the flip side of that is like you go to that heavy weight and you and you just start the, the first rep where you're getting ready and you're like, oh shit, this shit's going to crush me. Yeah, it's the wrong mentality. <laughs> yeah, you're fucked. yeah, you're yeah. fucked. And there's just the muscular aspect of it. You want to warm the muscle up, you know, for, um, you know, tendons tend to be a little, a little more elastic at higher temperatures. Mm. So it helps with the elasticity. It's probably an injury prevention thing there, okay. potentially, et cetera, okay. et cetera. And then I do. I'll um, back it down at that one heavy, heavy set, and then I'll try to back it down by 10, 15 pounds or percent, you know, and right. then and then try to get as many as I can, you know, 10, 12, 15, whatever. The, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Try to get as many as possible. What did Mincer do? Like he just had had him do like a supersetted pec deck and like an incline press or something like that. I think. Yep, yep. And yeah. you would you would do them, yeah superset together. You just go from one straight into the other. Yeah. And that's it. So so that's where one of the things that differs that the warm up differs and then the way he's supersetting them differs from what I'm doing. But I also see those like very similar lines, you know. That's it's made a it's made a lot of sense to me. How 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 important was like hey, was there ever a time that you because I know with DC you know that's been something that you were a big part of, and in it was a big part of your life and your training. Um, was there a time that you ever followed like the high intensity heavy duty program? Well, I, like I said that 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 um video with Marcus Reinhardt, a, a friend of mine gave that to me. She's okay. like, I figured you just like this, you know. Yeah. No, I never, I never explicitly followed that. I literally, the, the only programs I can think of that I've explicitly followed, I, I've, I've taken and begged and borrowed things. Yeah. And then I was doing a lot of things. I wasn't doing the, the cluster tests, but I was doing basically I, the same training frequency and about the same volume as DC training when I came across DC training. And then I said, well, I'm going to just do this because it was just like, it wasn't much of a mod- modification really. And then I followed it, of course, because Dave and I started doing that, and, and I suggested Dave get coached by by Dante, which he did. And then I did the Titan training. Oh yeah. Uh, whatever is best. Who know? I probably didn't do it properly, but I learned a lot from that. But I'm trying to think. No, I never really. Cause I I could I can't I couldn't even tell you because what Menser put forth changed over the years. So like. Okay. You know, like Dante, I think, still sticks with like the basic two way split training three times a week. Like that's like a good starting spot for someone who's like intermediate, okay. you know, who doesn't know they, you know, they haven't pushed things in various ways. That's a great place to begin if you really if you're really lacking in size. But but Menser, like you, you like listen to stuff he said near the end, the once a month type shit mm. versus, you know, what he was probably doing in that video. Yeah. And I don't even know if he had like a basic routine that people mm. follow like that's what Marcus did oh okay and I listen I watched that video it's been so long it was on, I have it on VHS so that tells you how old it is yeah he yeah. didn't even have DVDs then and I don't think and or he didn't even have it out in a DVD and I, I think he, he refers to the fact that the program that they demonstrate or but basically the the way in which they demonstrate HIT is a function of Marcus's advanced status so he was a national level guy at the time okay yeah you know, good bodybuilder he wasn't he never he never became a pro but he was like you know could have probably won a state show wherever he was he was competing yeah. at the usa's i think yeah so you know the thing that i want to reiterate here because it was something i thought about after doing another podcast and then i talked about on the brains and gains podcast with uh, dave mcconey that'll probably come out in a couple weeks okay. it was like it was gonna have three parts probably because oh, we talked wow. three hours and it applies to HIT. So on this podcast, the idea was, um, you know, generally volume versus intensity of effort. Okay. So HIT at one end of the spectrum, DC at that end of the spectrum, that side of the spectrum, then um, like Renaissance periodization, some of the things that Mike Isratel has put forth, the people who really are volume advocates and leaving a lot of reps in the tank. 
Okay. So, you know, better to even start off leaving like, you know, three or four reps in the tank at the beginning of a, a training blast when you're more likely to get sore. So you're more sensitive to the stimulus. And I agree with that. I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Like if people come back with fortitude training, if they've, if they've done a cruise and they come back into blast, yeah. um, you know, don't, if you know that you tend to get so don't start off with like the high volume to <laughs> just destroy yourself. Right. Yeah. You don't need it. You know, there's yeah. no reason for that. Get the most from the least. <clears throat> and the thing that I think happens as people get more advanced, there's two things that are going on. And this is why HIT makes sense, or at least moving in that direction makes sense. I think for, for many people is you learn to train harder um, over the course of decades. You're also, also getting older, Yeah. but what, what what the inroads to use sort of mensarian and that's a that's a mensar term I think I like it I don't like the term fatigue people talk about you know the fatigue that's incurred by a training blast or a training cycle okay because if you look in the exercise physiology uh, literature fatigue is used in a totally different way mm. people don't talk about fatigue in that way at all okay um, fatigue is like the percent decline in force over the course of an exercise test that, or that, how long you can yeah. run at a given intensity or something like that. That makes sense. How many reps you can do with 50% of a one rep max. That's your, it's an acute measurement, not a chronic indicator. Was, yeah. Training status. So anyway, um, so you get more advanced and, um, you're able to train harder. And now as, as you're, as you're, I'm going to go do it this way. So you're, there's a, there's a law of diminishing returns. So, you know, when you're a newbie, you can do anything and you gain some, you gain some muscle mass. Most people right. will your non-responder and then you know five ten years into it or even just a few years into it you're getting close to as much muscle you're going to gain hmm. yeah. so people will talk about um effective reps i'm sort of tying together some some principles so uh -huh. when you're starting off as a newbie let's say you're picking a 15 rep max you might get a, a set if you took that set all the way to the 15th rep those last three or four reps might have been effective ones people say five is the number that, hmm. that chris beardsley has come up with when i when he people sort of toss that as a blanket statement but the last five reps of set but that's not true if you're doing like uh if you pick a weight you could do six times you just do a single with it or a double well probably didn't get anything from that second rep yeah. so you could do it six times it's not nearly hard enough but there's something to say for that but over time if you look at your 15 rep max it might go from 225 to 405 so when you're a newbie, those last four or five reps are all effective. But as you get more and more advanced, looking just at your 15 rep max, you can't stop those sets five reps short or four reps short of failure mm. and expect to get a stimulus that's going to bring you closer to what your ultimate potential for muscle mass would be. That makes sense. You have to take those sets further you have to move closer and closer to failure. Huh, yeah. And Dave brought this up in the context of asking Brad Schoenfeld, who's done some of this literature, done some of this work. He's, I think he's an author on the, there's a meta-analysis looking at failure versus non-failure training. It suggests that failure training doesn't have any advantage over non-failure training. Yeah. It doesn't really matter, but most of those are with beginners. Mm. And John Meadows talks about like you're going to have you have those challenge sets you got to push yourself. Mm -hmm. DC Dante talks about that. I've got failure points in my training system. Jordan obviously is big on failure. Menser is huge on failure and the quality of the set. Mm -hmm. There's so many voices who are talking about people like trying to eke out all you possibly can from your training, which means you're talking about advanced people who are getting close to that asymptote where like the muscle mass they have is very near what they can possibly ever get mm -hmm. given the things they're doing with food and drugs and what have you. So the effective reps you get from any given set with a given load relative to your current strength levels becomes fewer and fewer. Now stopping at a 12 reps in a 15 rep max set, it might give you one effective rep, whereas that would yeah. give you two or three in the past. But when you're advanced, now you're using 405 as opposed to 225. Mm. So the volume that you can handle will tend to go down. Mm, yeah. This happened with Dorian Yates. You learn to train so friggin' hard, mm -hmm. hard um, and that's, you have to, because you're using those weights, 
that you can't, you can no longer do like, like, you know, I imagine doing like the, the Brad Schoenfeld study that people keep on bringing up where they were doing like 45 sets a week mm-hmm. and they're supposedly all to failure. Hmm. Try that, Scott. Give that a shot. There's no Scott, way. Talk to us two weeks later. See how you're doing. Scott, that last right? uh, that last dumbbell incline press that I did, I I normally, like I said, I do one set and then a back off set. I did the one set and I was done. Like yeah. normally, I do a back off set, but there's no need. I could tell I was like, God, right. there's. I want to leave the gym now. Like I got to, yeah. I got to go home and just cry because that's all I can handle. <laughs> right. right. So there's so there's two things happening. Then the number of sets that you can, because of how you're training, the load you're using. And how hard you have to train, the number of sets that you have that you can recover from goes down okay. if you're training in this way. You just can't keep doing 20 sets. Yeah. But in order to get reps that are effective, you have to take those sets closer to failure. Or if you're like oh, yeah. Mike Metz, you're to failure. And you may even have to use quote-unquote intensification techniques, force reps, force negatives. Cluster sets are kind of a way to do that in a way you're, you're eking out more effective reps. Mm-hmm. That's what a, a, an ARP arrest pause set is in DC training. Yeah. It's you're taking like maybe a 10 to 12 rep max and you go to failure. So you get two or three effective reps. You take your breaths, you use the same weight and you get three or four reps. Well, maybe not the first one, but the last two or three are effective reps. Yeah. So you spare yourself all those reps that really didn't do shit. Yeah. That way because they're not really going to, they're too easy. It's only at the end when you have maximal recruitment of the muscle and you're creating the stimulus with the combination of fatigue and tension. So you're, you're, you're collecting in the course of a rest pause set effective reps. Hmm. And so now you look at this advanced person in order to get an effective rep from a set, they have to go to failure. Yeah. And that means using heavier loads and, and that means they can only do, and because they're training harder than what they did when they were a beginner or an intermediate, they can only recover from so many. So your volume goes down and you have to train harder. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is, this is sort of my explanation for whether or not failure is important, um, or training closer to failure, at least learning how to train harder, the more advanced you got compared to when you were less trained. Okay. And that is, that's really at the root and the heart of what, what Mentzer had been saying, like through most of his sane years hmm. during a uh, high intensity training is that the essential feature of this, of weight training is what you get with those, with those effective reps at the end of the set. Hmm. And that's what you want. Those are the ones that you, those are the ones that matter. Hmm. So do your, do your sets to get all those effective reps and then get out of the gym and recover. Hmm. And if you really go like, and I think there's, I mean, if you think about it, like some people would, they might really have a 15 reps in them. Mm-hmm. If you said, you know what, we're going to, you know, your family's here. They're going to be sacrificed if you don't get 15. Well, they would get 15. Normally they might get 13. Yeah. But the inroads to recovery and quote unquote, the effectiveness of those last two reps mm-hmm. when it's a do or die situation, those reps, all effective reps are not equal. Hmm. So it's not like you're doing the set, you know, and you hmm. get to the 11th rep and all of a sudden there's number 12. That's an effective rep. Boom. It's a unit, you know, and number 13, huh. 12 and 13 are different. Huh? Yeah. 13 okay. Where you normally stop. That's yeah. where you're, that's where you would fail. Not necessarily maybe because the muscle couldn't produce more force, but psychologically hmm. you're just not willing to go past that. Yeah. But then you do 14 and 15. Those are, those would be, those, those are more effective, hmm. but there's a payoff. You go to failure, and something about, especially if it's truly failure, something about that will really whack you. Mm. And this is what I found, like because you, you know this, if like you t- did that, like let's say you did that have that lighter set, it's a true failure, and went back to try to do it, you could rest five minutes, right? Like the muscle should be, re- everything should be good to go. Yeah, you'd probably be three or four reps short of what you got the first time. Hmm. Yeah, even though the effort, like, is that about right? I mean, at least two reps probably shy. At, at least, yeah, yeah. Hey, what's up, guys? Scott McNally here, and we're gonna we're gonna jump to a quick commercial break. So I promise that I'll be brief with this. So this week we have five podcasts coming out between uh, the new improved drugs and stuff. We have our 
Road to North Americans, of course, Ron and Dusty are back. And then we have uh, Dr. Scott Stevenson laying down some sick knowledge about HIT training. And uh, we have our new show, Renegade Muscle, with uh, the one and only Lee Priest, along with Jeff Roberts. You know, I'm recording every single one of these programs. I do all the, the editing, the art, the MP3, the YouTube. Um, and, you know, and it takes a lot of time. I'm not complaining because this is definitely a labor of love. I'm I'm living my best life through this. But the only way I can make that work is by somehow getting paid in the process. And that's where our advertisers come in. So, guys, if you enjoy the shows, then I encourage you to shop with our advertisers because I put these advertisers together with our programs because I, I believe in them, A, and B, because they're companies that make sense, you know, for us. TrueNutrition.com has some of the greatest supplements that are out there for some fantastic prices. I absolutely believe in them. And they basically carry everything that a bodybuilder could use from health supplements to performance supplements and a lot more. They have basically every protein under the sun, every flavor that you could think of. Uh, And uh, they have it all for reasonable prices. So check them out, truenutrition.com, and you can use our code ADVICES. And then you can check out getazoth.com, where we also have a link to their Amazon. Both of those, you can use the code ADVICES. Devices 10, and they have some of the best nootropics that are available out on the market. If you're looking to to like up your edge in life, those things can definitely help. They're they're fun to experiment, and uh, it's fun to see. You know, like basically just well, I use them with my podcasting, and uh, I definitely know that I've gotten an edge. So you can get an edge anywhere, be it in work or the gym or a long road trip, whatever it may be. But like I said, I've paired with the advertisers that I believe in and advertisers that make sense to us. So if you enjoy our programming and that these are the types of products that you would buy anyway, then please consider shopping with our sponsors and using our codes because that allows me to continue to put these podcasts out. All right, guys, thanks for listening to me. I appreciate it. We've got links in the show notes. Let's get back to the program. Yeah. So also too, I found that not only the my quality will be better. Like if I'm using the heaviest weight I can, what I want to do on that back offset is like wield even more control, like hyper control that back offset. If that makes sense. Yeah. Really, yield wield as much control over that weight as I can with the negatives and in making it count as much as I possibly can. Which it's just impossible to do with like the absolute heaviest weight you can handle, you know? Yeah. The research supports that with the, when I do this mind muscle connection lecture, they, you can look at EMG and you tell people like on a bench press, yeah, don't use your triceps, use your pecs. And so you, you, you have a one rep max, you sort of establish the baseline EMG. And then you look at the ratio of the activation of those two muscle groups, the triceps versus pecs. And people can do that at 40, 50, 60%. Mm-hmm. You can effectively preferentially use the target muscle. Yeah. But when you get so heavy that no, you don't see the difference anymore. And of course, of course you don't because when it's your one rep max, you're using everything maximally. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no way to like, you have, you have to use triceps and pecs as much as almost as much as possible when you're at 90% of one rep max. Yeah. So like 80% is like a, on, on a barbell press would be like eight to 10 reps maybe. Yeah. That's about where the mind muscle connection can no longer at least be um, measurable in terms of EMG. You're getting a smile like someone I just to something. No, I want to take a minute for everybody who's listening to the show right now just to point out that I made an observation about something that's like really profound to me in the gym and automatically Scott has a study that he can cite <laughs> and give me some serious like concrete evidence to back up what I'm talking. I love that. That's that's uh that's what Muscle Minds is about right there, guys. There's that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's it's funny because like people will fall into one of two camps, like they're the bros and we can figure all this all out in the gym and you can. Yeah. And like and also you know, science can figure out a lot of this stuff. And there's you know, post people say like the bro, you know, the science guys wearing their you know the, the pencil necks with their pocket protectors and their, you know, glasses with the tape in the middle and all this stuff. Yeah. Like they don't get in the gym and figure shit out. And that's to some degree that's that's true. You don't see a lot of big jack guys that are also, you know, toiling away in the ivory tower doing their stuff. But it's all the same universe, as I say. Like mm. the universe that's being, you know, explored in the lab is the same universe that's being explored in the in the gym. Mm. And that shit should overlap to some degree if you really understand the science. Yeah. And you really understand what's going on in the gym. So like those two things, it's like 
yeah, there has to, it's not like, like the physics are different, you know, like, you know, stuff that's green here is red here. It, it doesn't happen that way, you know? Yeah. So there's always like, I find I, those are the connections I always look for, you know? Yeah. 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 I have a hard time with it sometimes with the study stuff, just because yeah. like when you tell me that like, well, it doesn't matter if you go to failure or not. I'm like, but, yeah. but it does. And I'm like, I just don't, I don't want to, I don't want to spend my life arguing about it. And especially because I can only tell you, like, I just no, I know that's not a fact, period. I'm not going to talk anymore. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. When someone just says that, and this is why Brad answered that question in that way when Dave on his The Brains and Games podcast asked him about it. He's like, because Brad was a trainer for decades. Okay. Like, he was in the gym. Yeah. He's not known as this monstrous guy, but he's competed before, I think. I think there's a picture of him on stage. I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, so that's why how he came to all this. He's like, you know, there's all this shit I want to, like, see if the science can – can back it up and that's why he's done the very cool stuff he's done mm. and he has the sense that 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 statement that failure doesn't matter is not is not an accurate one when it comes to advanced guys mm. and you know that my explanation that what i was rambling about about for those last you know 10 minutes about effective reps yeah is why i think that makes a difference but if you look at those studies most very often the large majority of the studies are done with untrained people because they grow really well and you you need to see some muscle mass changes if you're going to look to see if something matters for muscle mass. Yeah, yeah. If you take people in the gym and you train them for 12 weeks and nobody grows in either group, like, yeah. well, that doesn't really help. Like, you need to have the effect. You know, does it change hunger? Well, if hunger's not changing, like, you can't tell whether or not, like, something is working to change hunger or not. Or right. whatever your dependent variable is. And with untrained people... Like they're getting so many effective reps. If you stop, you know, shy of failure, you've got, you know, someone might do if they stop four shy of failure versus one shot or take it to failure. Yeah. Or let's say three, two shy of failure versus failure. They're still getting three effective reps. Mm, right. Right. And there's going to be so much variability. We talked about this before in the podcast, the study, the study where the initial publication was frequency of training doesn't matter. They looked at two and three times and five times a week training. That's right. Yeah. Train the left leg, train the right leg, right? Yeah. It was, it didn't matter like, cause they took the means and there's so much variability. Like the statistics didn't suggest any difference, but when they looked at the individual data points, mm -hmm. people were training one leg one way and the other leg the other way mm. and that made a difference. Mm. Then it mattered for those individuals. Yeah. Some grew really well. Some didn't grow really well. Some did better with higher frequency. Some did better with lower frequency. Yeah. So you find like if it in in and it makes sense. Like if you look at a pop, look at the studies which have largely investigated whether failure or not or not matters in untrained individuals or previously untrained individuals. You find that you don't see a general generally speaking a difference. Doesn't matter. So you don't gotta like destroy your. You're, um, it makes sense actually for adherence if you're a trainer mm, yeah. and you want to make sure people kind of like the training. Like if you go in and like just try to destroy them and like, you know, you're screaming with you know bloodshot <laughs> eyes and veins popping out of your head. Yeah. They, you know, they can smell what you had for breakfast that day. Um, you don't want that. That's not going to like keep, keep people coming back. They can stop if you were, and they're going to get a lot of the gains that they're going to get. Hmm. Probably, you know, if you get most of your gains in like the first two years of training, which a lot of people will. Because they're just not going to push beyond that, then you know no people aren't doing studies failure versus non non failure that last two years. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you're probably going to get you know eighty percent versus a hundred percent, and given how much muscle people gain, that's like I don't know. Let's say that's like twelve versus fifteen pounds of muscle mass over two years. Yeah, and not having so the like, head gone crazy then you yeah. know in the process and for two years, and your joints exactly. are probably going to be better off. And then I guess that makes sense to yeah, those people. Yeah. But for people who are trying to do what you're trying to do, or me, or Jordan, or what Dante and Dante's clients, and what Marcus Reinhardt, et cetera, it, it, it can make a difference. Yeah. For the re like you, if you don't, if you don't go really close to failure, you're not going to make any progress because you're not creating any effective reps. The stimulus is there's no stimulus. And I think everybody who's listening or watching this now has been there at some point where they've yeah. been working out and not making progress because most people in the gym. Like you could, I could really say most people, if you take some time away from the gym that you normally go to and you come back six months later, people look pretty much the same when you come back. Oh yeah. That's something Dante said again and again. It's all, yeah, it's, yeah it's out the people. Yeah. And it's just, um, a lot of people aren't willing to push beyond that. You know, mm -hmm. they just, 
you know, they just they go to the gym just to talk and that kind of stuff too. So the question is then is like, you know, we all love working out, but it's like, are you going to be willing then to still do what it takes to grow? You know what I mean? Like, are you really going to be willing? Because you can. That's what I'm seeing now. I guess I'm seeing is that you can. You still can. You know. And you got to push the food. Like yeah. the other big thing that people and this is this has come up. Dave, <clears throat> Dave has um, who did the brain, does the brains and gains. He's posted on Professional Muscle about this topic with Dante, and they're actually like it's an active thread right now. Okay. <clears throat> and <clears throat> when someone's a beginner, you, you got the holy grail. You can literally just. You can gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. Yeah, yeah. There's study, studies of like people like they're just like gym classes like back in the 50s and 60s. And they just they just have a group that would weight train. And they have a group that would start a jogging program. Okay. And they look at they just do like hydrostatic weighing, underwater weighing. And they get like the equivalent changes in muscle in fat-free mass. Yeah. Just from becoming more active. I could see that. They gain fat, just, they're, just, they're just jogging. That's not a great way to put on muscle mass. Yeah. But you're so sensitive to the increased activity, your body will change that way. So you get someone who's trained for like four or five years, <clears throat> and they're like, I want to put more muscle on my arms. And I've tried supersets and drop sets, and you know, I'm doing all this crazy stuff. And it's like, well, okay, so you've been doing this for two years, your arms haven't grown. And you say, well, those things don't work. It's like, well, how much weight have you gained? Yeah. None, like nothing. I weighed 190 two years ago. I went 191 right now. It's like, why would you expect your arms to grow? Hmm. You can't, like, you could do that initially, mm-hmm. but eventually you you also need to have everything else in place mm. to support the anabolic stimulus that you provided with the, with the training. That makes sense. And, and that's like, that's the thing that you don't, it's kind of funny. Nowadays, they will, in many of the studies, like a lot of the ones that Stu Phillips does, I notice this if you read the methods. Okay. They will provide their subjects with a like a twenty gram bolus of protein. Okay. After the training, like that's just a standard. They'll just do that because they know that that increases the protein synthesis brought on by the training. Okay. It's just like smart. Like why would you, um, you know, you just why would you administer a, a training a variable or a training a, a workout and then not do the things to support that? You you're doing that so you can create growth and then determine whether some condition. In, impacts the growth or not the frequency of training or some other supplement or what have you so if it's not if they're giving no supplements they'll just give the protein mm, okay and that's the thing like with advanced trainees it's very unless the study is looking at nutrition specifically they'll just they'll sometimes they'll do a you know a recall which are notoriously inaccurate okay um, what's a recall yeah, just, what is it like oh, a, di- a dietary recall like, like, tell us what you ate oh i see okay you know, yeah, and, and, you know, it's better than nothing. Sure. But, you know, but people will just, if they sort of think, like, what is, you know, what am I supposed to be doing? They'll sort of, like, they'll fudge, sometimes unconsciously, the things that they, they write down. Mm, yeah. You know, it's like, well, I would, I normally I would eat that. So they just write it in. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. So, but you don't, like, take advance, you know, and say, okay, well, here's what we know from, generally speaking, from the literature. We need to ensure that you have this much protein. We need to ensure that you have a, that you're actually gaining weight. Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, a pound a week or something like that. And you could almost like, I would love to see like it's, this would be like impossible to do because there's so much effort that goes into training studies. Hmm. But you could almost like literally say, you know, if you don't, if we don't get you gaining like at least one pound mm-hmm. a week or a half a pound or something, the weight has to be going up, then we're not, we wouldn't expect you to get any muscle at all because you, you don't hmm. have the nutritional status to bring that about. So hmm. it's like, there's no point even like looking at your data. Yeah. Okay. We know we're not going to get anything out of you if you're advanced. Like if you, so if someone comes like I've been training for five years, you know, and I've been trying to put weight on my, my mass on my arms and I'm doing all these things. I'm like, well, what's your, what's your, what's your diet? Like, this is what Dante is actually saying now that I think about it in that thread. Okay. You know, it's like, like one guy, I can't remember who it was. I just read Dante's response. And one guy said he put on 40 pounds and like all that was fat or something like that. Oh, wow. And it's like, Dante's like, hey, that's not training, dude. Like, that's your diet. Like, yeah. something's wrong with your diet. Yeah, like, I started you know, lifting weights. Genetics, but, but <laughs> started... That's like extreme. Like, maybe your just genetics are that terrible yeah. that you just gain 40 pounds. Like, normal, on average, people put on about one-third of the weight just in overfeeding studies from fat-free mass. Huh. That's what they generally show. But yeah. there's variability there. It's definitely not the training. I'm just imagining, like, oh, I started going to the gym, and I'm getting fatter every, <laughs> every week. I can't. 
I don't know what's yeah. going on. I did more bench press, and now I've got even fatter. <laughs> Getting fatter, yeah. But but that's the thing. Like I always say, if, if you could just take that one third of your weight gain from fat free mass and turn it into two thirds. Yeah. So you put on thirty oh. pounds, you get twenty pounds of muscle. Oh yeah, pretty I'll good. Take it. It's not bad. I um without having increased anything else at first. I you know I, I had kind of built my food up and I've kept it where it is. And now my latest. This is my my latest change, Scott. I'm adding this in as of uh, as of I'm my in. next workout. Mountain Dogs Perry MD from our sponsor True Nutrition. I love this stuff too because you know what? It doesn't fill me up one scoop while I'm mm-hmm. training. So I get 25 extra grams carbs plus I get some essential amino acids and I'm going to go back to doing a protein shake post workout just one scoop. That I haven't been doing that. That doesn't that leaves my stomach like gastric emptying happens fast for me with that. And I'm not like feeling like bloated and all like, you know, just bloated in, in full. Other carbs I've done, sometimes I'll feel bloated in full for a couple hours after I train. Like yeah, maltodextrin. Dextrose. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, 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 for sure. So you know, I was gonna say the other thing too that's interesting, like this I've mentioned this before. Yes, I wanted to hear about this book. Yeah, so what this is this? Is, um professional intensity training techniques, cost in Foitzenreuter. Cost in Fort the book it keeps going like it's blurred out with your oh, background. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. The 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 background blur was catching it. It looked like we were yeah, trying to no, blank I, it I, out. Yeah, so, I, that. Um, so this is only in German, so people aren't gonna. They haven't translated to English. But you can find videos of people doing these sets. What is this? Are, so there's actually a study I, I I dug up not too long ago, and they they compared. Um, like just regular straight sets with a, a kind of a rest pause technique. And, um, and, then, and then they had another group that basically was doing this. And in the rest pause technique, I think they used like 80% of a one rep max. Um, and, uh, and they dropped the weight down after a given number of, you know, it was basically very similar to a rest pause uh, style cluster set from DC training. In this, what was basically very close to this, you you basically do um, intermittent reps, widowmaker style, until you just but you're resting in between, so you can put the weight down until you just can't lift it anymore. Wow! And in in this study, they they progress them based on their their performance during the training, um, the training regi- or the training uh, sessions, and they had them using ninety percent of a one rep max. Okay, and they were, which is normally about a three rep max, like the weight you can lift like three times. Yeah, and they would increase the weight when those people were able to do eighteen reps in a set. <laughs> so it was a long time then. Yeah, they would rest between. I was like trying to figure what the hell they did, and they they weren't like it wasn't a standardized rest interval. They would let them rest up to twenty seconds, so between five and twenty seconds. So they they pick up a a, a near max load, like yeah. a triple. Wait, they could probably do three times. There's no fourth rep because it's so heavy. Yeah. And they and they'd start doing reps and resting in between up to twenty seconds. They would do as many reps as they could or just one rep? They would they would they would manage their fatigue to get as many reps as long as they didn't rest more than twenty seconds in between. Holy that was crap. Kind of their limit. So like imagine like, you know, you're um like what could you do for a a triple on dumbbell presses? I've never tried, but if I'm at the one tens, let's just say hundred and fifty. 150s. So, imagine, imagine you have those set up with um, uh, like you've got some daisy chains around them, and you're in a you're in like a, a power rack, so that like you have a starting spot, and you can just let go. Yep. And rest. So you got the 150s, and they're dangling there. Mm-hmm. You got power hooks, maybe, which is a great product. We talked about power hooks before. You can you, they fit around the dumbbell handle, and they have hooks. You can put it on a bar up above your head, so you have a starting spot. Yeah. But you now you just got them dangling right here. So you do you take those 150s and you do a double. Okay, you don't go to failure because you're going to see you want to get as many reps as you can. And like your life depends on getting as many reps as long as you don't rest 20 seconds. So then you do a single and you just rest hmm. five to 20 seconds and do another single and just rest. Maybe you rest eight seconds this time. So okay. you can get another up single. Up to 20. Up to a- 18 was the number, oh, the up criteria to 18. number they used. Well, when people like that's just friggin' brutal. Yeah, that is. These are like you can watch these videos of these people. Like th- these are like 
these are like like widow maker, like hyper widow makers. They're just ridiculous. Yeah. Because you're just you're just trying to get as many reps as you can um, with that weight, and you rest in between. You just kind of keep going until like your will breaks every yeah. time. Like every <laughs> set is like that. <laughs> like even with a widow maker, the idea is like there's some limit on how many reps you're going to get because you you have to you don't let go of the weight. You still <laughs> keep it on your back or yeah. you're holding it or whatever. So eventually fatigue will just prevent you from continuing. Well, on this one, you're resting in between, like you're managing your fatigue. So those are those had to be like, let's say the average 10 seconds, they did 18. So that's like 180 seconds just to rest. So that's mm-hmm. like three minutes of rest. That's a lot. Yeah. Plus the reps. Those are like four minute sets. Yeah, that's a long, brutal yeah. set from hell is what that and is. The, and the point that, that there's some various things that happen in the study, but one of the things is, the group that did that did not grow as well the group as the group that did a more normal rest pause style set. Mm. Probably because they were doing too much. Okay, yeah. And that and that's the thing too that you ha- and I, I'm tying this back into HIT training and what you obviously have figured out is this notion that you have a stimulus and you have an adaptation and at some point your stimulus and adaptation are optimized. That could be two sets. That could be one set. Yeah. If you do three sets, you may have to rest six days. If you do two sets, you may have to rest four days. Yeah. One set you may have to rest two days. But once you go past that, if you try to do six sets in a training session and try to come back at all to failure, because that's where you're getting effective reps, you're not going to recover from that two days later. You're not going to be recovered. So these guys were doing – those what their sets were like. Yeah. Up to 18 reps like that. I Yeah, I need a lot of time five, off. Like, I need like, a <laughs> I mean, imagine someone who's just like totally, uh, you know, berserker. Yeah. Who is like doing 15 seconds and between those 18 reps, so they've uh-huh. got like, or even even 20. So that would be that'd be 360 seconds, you know, something like that, you know. Yeah. If they did that many, and so that's that's like six minutes of that's like those are five to eight minute sets. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I would love to see like more data, like documenting like what the like those sorts of things because if you're going to take this information it's it points you in the right direction but like what did, were they really what do these, these things really look like yeah yeah training you know like what actually was going on you describe them you know and, and it's like you kind of know the basics but you don't really know like there's that there's that sub, like the subjective effort level mm-hmm. is a big piece of okay this. that's a huge thing because i kind of was thinking that too i you know your version of three reps to failure, absolute failure, I think is going to be a lot different than we'll say like what my version was five years ago. Eric Helms is the one who really kind of, it was his research that brought the reps and reserve notion okay. into the literature. And he's, and in his studies, I've heard him talk about on his podcast, like one of the, they would ask people like estimate your reps and reserve. Yeah. And they would be they would be off like by ten reps. So like, oh, I think I got two or three more left. And then when they actually push them yeah. to failure, they'd get ten or twelve reps. Huh. Wow. I they believe it. Way the hell off. I believe it. So then, if you if you if you take that for those individuals who might have grown from what they perceived to be, you know, a twelve rep max, when actually it was a twenty two rep max. Mm-hmm. Well, they're getting they're they and they so maybe maybe they have the last twelve reps are effective reps for them. Yeah, because they got some growth. Yeah, out of doing twelve reps with a twenty-two rep max, and like in the extreme case, or most people maybe off by like I don't know what the numbers are. Let's say it's an average, or they're off by five reps. Okay, so they actually had five more in the tank than what they guessed, and they're still stopping. You know, a couple reps shy of failure. Yeah, um, or or maybe they're yes, yeah, so or maybe they take what they do go to what they think is failure. And they just stop there because they think oh, I got two or three more left, and they just stop because. No one's telling them to keep going, and they just fail because that's what they've sort of predestined yeah. in their mind during the course of the set. But they actually got five more, yeah. but they still grow from that. So that means like the last three or four reps were maybe effective. Yeah. So the last eight reps of a 15 rep max set might be effective reps for someone who's untrained right. initially. Right. So yeah, that's gigantic. Here's the thing that um is is interesting that I think is a major. It's a confounding factor. It seems to be at least that we're sort of exploring here with the podcast is that, um, and what Eric has talked about in the rep reserve thing is that people in the, in the, in the research studies, just to sort of like have a quantifiable stimulus, they just say, we took the sets to failure. 
Mm. A lot of a lot of that's like a st- let's just like we're not going to say like stop three reps shy of failure. They did X number of reps in reserve. In some studies, they've done that when that was part of what they're trying to um, examine or like the like Cody Hahn. There's a study by with Cody Hahn that looked at sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and they employed um, a reps and reserve type of thing where they they build up volume. Et cetera, et cetera. Hmm. And so that was part of that study. Like that's one I can think of off the top of my head. But normally it's like, no, we just do X number of work sets to failure. Standard warm up re- protocol, and then you do all your sets for the failure. But that, then that's like, so then you kind of like check that box in your method section, all the sets were to failure. But it really doesn't check the box. Yeah, right. Because if you're just saying like go to failure, like sometimes you can check that box by, by like you know measuring an exam like the duration of a rep or rep speed, mm-hmm. people have looked into that. You know the vo- velocity based training has become a thing. Mm-hmm. So obviously, if you're really if you're really training all out, and you can see this, if you take muscle that that is artificially activated, you know you would you see it, it produces force and the force just slowly declines. Right. So if someone's doing like continuous reps, you know, and they're going at a rep speed, eventually. As fatigue ensues, mm-hmm. the reps slow down until they come to a, a grinding halt. Right. You wouldn't see like what you see with beginners, like, okay, I'm going. It's like, oh, this is getting hard. Woo, I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. That was like the last rep looked like the first rep, you know? Yeah. So you can document that. But a lot of studies, they just said we took it to failure. Right. And like that can mean, according to what, what Eric has demonstrated, that can mean a difference in five reps, you know, depending on who you're talking about as mm-hmm. far as where whether it's truly to failure because that's all over the place that's a huge difference in the actual stimulus that's evoked right and it's just because of psychological reasons hmm. and that's why you know sometimes people who are like in in the physics or some of the harder sciences mm-hmm. we can actually measure everything like you know very accurately and distinctly they're, they're like you know exercise science is so soft and weak because like it's all about like how you know you're how, how hard you're willing to push in your brain hmm. Failure is like just kind of dependent on the person, you know, what their pain tolerance is and all these psychological things. Yeah. You're not actually like you don't don't really have a distinctly quantifiable stimulus that's the same for all trainees. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's It's a matter of like, you know, like with animal research, at least like, you know, you have all the rats that are pups from the same litter and they're basically genetically identical. Right. But you take humans in and you line up all those people, like all the all the guys in your research study, like all the college age guys. Yeah. With a lot of these studies with college age guys, does that apply to thirty five year old guys whose testosterone levels are going down? Hold their topic. Yeah. But you look at those guys and you're like, Okay, so that guy like that guy won't make eye contact with anyone. He's really kinda anxious, you know. Yeah. He's here because he's you know, probably he got sand kicked in his face. Like that's you know, that's kind of part of his mo. Yeah, he he wants to like build up his self confidence, and you've got another guy who's just like itching to get on there, and like he wants to do like give me some more. Like, can we do more sets? Like no, <laughs> don't get the train until you come in tomorrow or whatever. <laughs> like stop. Right. Well, that's a whole like you've got to totally. It's like it's like doing a research study, and like you know, so we we just went out and gathered a random collection of wild animals. You know, so we had a <laughs> raccoon and a bear and a rabbit and a deer. <laughs> And we decided to do, you know, We're running just, training with them and yeah, like see like what see what kind of animal, yeah, or, yeah, see, you see, yeah, see what the average is of how fast. They, for some reason, the raccoon runs a lot slower than the bear, you know. Yeah, and like, yeah, but but you, but the people would totally balk at that. Yeah, but you're not even the same huh. species. Like you can't really compare, you know, apples and oranges, bears and raccoons. Yeah, but but when it comes to the the psychology that you see, and we know this. When you just look at how people train, like go in the regular gym. Yes, exactly. And you see the average person wait. Like I usually see people who are reading their papers while they're doing knee extensions. Yeah. You know, and some people like they do a knee extension. They don't even know what muscle they're activating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, 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 they just, like, I, I might, I'm training my whole, like a hamstring. Like, no, that's just because your leg's pressing into the pad. It's not very well padded. That's why it hurts down there. <laughs> You're not using your hamstrings <laughs> for that, you know? Yeah. So they can't do And then you got people like Jordan. Yeah. You know, who every time he trains, he does his effort levels beyond what most people would probably experience in their entire lifetime, at yeah. least in the Western world. Hey, I got to throw in a guy named uh, Juan listener. Um, I believe he said he is. Uh, Where's he coming from? He says regards from Mexico. He said we keep mentioning this guy named Jordan. 
and he said, who, who is this? Jordan Peters. I wanted to yeah. throw that out there for him who's watching. He, uh, Not Jordan Peterson, but Jordan Peters. Jordan Peters, very different guy, but uh, also has some interesting philosophies. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, in his own right. Yeah. So, but that, that to failure training, it's, it's you know, it, it makes sense to do that, but without some assurance in some way, shape, or form that that, that, that there's something that is somehow equalize the training stimulus across subjects yeah. across groups really there's there's so much there that can that can contribute to the variability i think that makes sense yeah yeah so. which i guess that you you know what that's part of it i guess when i say like ah, i'm not i'm not a big study guy like because i feel that way like i'd prefer to i'd prefer to like listen to some like actual mm-hmm. in the trenches experience like to me listening to Menser like fires me up um, right. And then I guess that's part of it is like there's all those little nuances, I guess, to really make. I mean, and I'm not saying you can't get anything out of training. I'm not saying I'm like anti stud or studies. I'm not saying I'm anti studies, but it does. It does leave like there's there's so much like it sounds like you could make a study quite complex. You could you could take a lot of time to set that up, hand pick 20 people that were all going to have the same mindset on what failure was, for instance, that would mm-hmm. in itself would be it would be tough to do. Yeah, it is. It's just, I think the thing that a lot of times many people who are talking about science, um, like when you're, when, when people, you, the average person that, for instance, you would be exposed to who's talking about the scientific findings has probably just read the abstract. Okay. They may, they may even have just a master's degree level, which is pretty, which should be pretty good. Sure. But it's not always, I know this from personal experience. Okay. Um, that having a master's degree doesn't necessarily, even having a PhD in some cases doesn't mean that much, but you're not, listening to people like like Stu Phillips or Brad Schoenfeld mm. and Brad Brad like he knows the limitations okay. of studies yeah you know and, th- and there are ways to delimit studies too so we take huh. people in who you know are not on HRT and you know they they don't we, we limit those people coming in because we know that those factors may like for instance um when I did my dissertation uh-huh. uh we wouldn't let people in who were using um albuterol oh, okay I had a couple people I had to exclude because albuterols kind of like clenbuterol, which clenbuterol is known at least in animal work for sure to induce muscle growth. It's potentially an anabolic agent. Yeah. So I had to exclude, I think, two people who had asthma Okay. because of that. So you have to exclude these sorts of things. So if you really look at the studies and you recognize what the limitations are and where you would be violating this this idea of external validity, like does, do the, do the un, untrained people who maybe are training with you know another eight reps in the tank on average, does that really apply to someone who's been at it for 20 years? Right. No, not in in many ways. No, but but there are things that you can take from there. You just need to know how to weigh those in your mind. It doesn't like it's still the same universe, right? You know, so like this, like the, this idea of different frequency of training being different, um, being, being better or worse for a given individual. So you saw that like huge variation in that study. Like one leg trained two or three times a week, the other leg trained five times a week. Yeah, some people did better with five. Some people. Well, that there's no reason to think that that doesn't apply to advanced people. Right. We know this. You know, we know this is the case. Jordan's gigantic trains the way that he does. A lot of guy, a lot of pros will train with a quote unquote bro split. You know, less flare, lower frequency, higher volume. So you see the same thing. You just you just need to like understand what the limitations are and not take it too far. Yeah. And that takes an under. There's just so much to it. It takes it, it, it but it only takes a little bit of digging, really. Mm. There was a study that, or Victor Black posted about this on on Facebook. Okay, and um, he, he had he was on a um, a podcast, uh, or he and I were on a podcast, Joe Jeffries' podcast, yeah. with Austin Stout. And he posted about you know the sort of the thing that he like you got so many of these scientists who are like that's their wheelhouse and that's their perspective and they don't really they haven't been in the trenches. And he posted uh, in, in talking about this idea, he posted. Uh, uh, just a screen capture from Instagram where someone was talking about, um, God, what was it? It was uh, was an arginine. It was a supplement that increased growth hormone levels, mm-hmm. and it did. You know, it, it, it when you ran the stats, have it, taking the supplement in these conditions in the in the morning had an in, impact on growth hormone levels. But so I'm like, okay. So I went. I, I actually found the study, read the study. And then I went and looked at what 
variations in growth, knowing that growth hormone is pulsatile in nature mm. and how high it can get at night, mm -hmm. like the increases in growth hormone after this supplement was given were like, you know, a third, a quarter of what max values would be at, during sleep. So if you want to get a better growth hormone uh, level, just take a nap. Yeah. You're going to get higher, higher on average, you get higher peaks. Yeah. And all that just took me some time. I just went and I looked at the numbers. I had to convert the units. Mm -hmm. The units were in, in uh, like nanomoles per milliliter, and I had to convert it to I use per liter or whatever, a more typical unit. And I, but I just compared the math. It's like, well, that's not really relevant. Like, yeah, it happened. Yeah. You could throw it in your face. It increased growth hormone significantly. It's like, okay, so, you know, it's like, it's like, so you get free gas when you, when you go to the, go to the Wawa station. It's like, okay, like they give you like two ounces of gas. <laughs> it's free gas, right? Yeah, yeah. And everyone who went to Wawa got, had higher gas than the people who went to the Circle K. Yeah. Well, it's two ounces of gas. Like that just, that'll get you down the block. Yeah. That's not, it's insignificant in a practical reward setting. So you dig in, you look at the research, like, what can I take from that? Well, yeah, maybe if I go to Wawa every day mm -hmm. and get my gas there and I take two ounces times 365, <laughs> yeah, that makes a difference. I'll take a couple free tanks of gas over the course of the year yeah. and do that. But I'm not expecting that to like increase, you know, the, 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 the distance I can travel with my car. Like all of a sudden now I can start taking road trips, you know, to Canada and back or right. whatever right. in your case. So you just have to spend some time digging in. Mm -hmm. So the scientists tend time digging in, understanding what the limitations are of their studies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's like their that. version of the guy who's like going in the gym and tinkering around with huh. the things that you've talked about doing. Yeah. And they're, they're just two sides of the same coin. I, okay. I like that. I like to know that. I, I guess what, you know, what bothers me in that those are off, we're way off tangent now. It's the guys that, uh, that just like cite something, you know, it's like to prove, to prove a point that's often to, to, to tell us that we've been wrong about everything we know. <laughs> that, that's, yeah. the, that's the stuff that, that right. I think and is, that's, I and think that's of. painting a black and white picture and yeah. it's really not black. Like you wouldn't say, you wouldn't tell, um, you know, uh, Nathan to Asha, who I think trains with pretty high volume. Like he's got a great chest. Like, dude, you're doing too much volume. Right. Right. No, you know, you know, I, Ronnie, dude, I better not tell him anything. <laughs> Ronnie, you should have trained like Dorian. Dorian, you should have trained like Ronnie. Like, yeah, no, and, and the science actually supports that idea that there's different frequencies and volumes yeah. for different people if you look at deeply at the science. Yeah. So the two, the two things don't contradict one another, really. And the people that will come out with a black and white, in many, in many cases, they're not – they haven't dug in enough. They're, they're like, the, like the, the person who's gone to the gym. They've been training for like maybe three or four or five years. I'm kind of stereotyping. And all of a sudden, they – they figure out, and I've even had people do this with fortitude training. They're like, oh, fortitude training, that's the only training system I'll ever use again. It's awesome. It's like, it's the greatest thing. And I'm like, I wouldn't do that. Like, you mm. know, don't, don't write your name in blood, but always doing fortitude training. It works well for you. That's great. But so someone reads a study and, you know, says, well, this is the way the, the numbers are black and white. It's like, well, pay attention. How does that don't, you know, see the forest from the trees here? How does it all fit together? Yeah. You know, and that's 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 really and a lot of times what people just haven't dug in enough. There's still the people who are doing that. You won't see a, a really good scientist do that, hmm. in yeah. my opinion. They'll they will always. That's why they speak in circles. Like that's why I have these long convoluted sentences sometimes <laughs> because context <laughs> is so much. Right. Right. Yeah. And you can't really convey the idea in a simple way, simple terms because they're not simple ideas. Yeah. I live my life uh, talking to somebody that speaks that way. Yeah, you do, of course. <laughs> and there's very good reasons for it. Yeah, and you yeah. love her to death. Yeah, right? she wants to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed if she's going to say something, you know. Right. Yeah, but there's but the information density is important, mm. you know. Yeah. Well, my head's spinning here, Scott. I'm spinning with thoughts of Mike Menser and hit training. You want to go to grad school now, don't you? You want to get your PhD? I can tell. I want to go to the gym, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go in today's I today's. Want to go Today's a non-training day, so I'm not. But how about, are you training today? Yeah, uh, today's an upper body day, Ooh. muscle round style. We, we're we're like uh, an hour uh, and 15 minutes in here. How Do you, do you want to try to answer any of our questions, or you want to maybe uh, take them on the next one? What do you think? Do we have any pop-up? We had the... some pop-up on the feed, yes. Ooh, let's see what, what we get. That sounds fun. All right, here we go. Let's see what we got here. We had a question about uh, prostate health. 
pull this one up on the screen here. Uh, hey guys, love the content. Prostate health. I have an enlarged prostate. Uh, PSA is climbing. Have had a checkup. I did try Rad 140. Um, that uh, I think it means Dante suggested a year ago. Is it Dante? I don't know. Danta. Uh, suggested a year ago. I don't remember him suggesting Rad 140. Uh, dropped a whole point, now climbing again. Any thoughts or advice on supplements that really work, like saw, palmetto, and doses? This is from Jerry. Ooh. Yeah, so um, I would, uh, let's see, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm reading that, I'm trying to decipher Danta. So Dante, someone suggested using a, uh, a SARM. Yeah, I, that's what I don't. Yeah, the lower prostate. Um, I don't know about that. Yeah, I, I prostate health. That's a pretty important one. My dad, um, prostate cancer is probably what got him. Okay. So prostate, you know, health is near and dear to my heart, so to speak. I would check with the doc, you know, and see, check in on that. I wouldn't try to if it's if it's climbing and it's still climbing, especially. I would go go see a physician, you know, and see what's going on there. Um, that could, you know, that could be his, like, what's your family history of cancer? That's the type, like, he's, he's asking for, like, cancer cures. Like, okay. Potentially, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I may, I'm, maybe I'm uh, blowing this out of proportion, but, yeah, just watch the watch the PSA thing. That's not, uh, not one to mess around with. All right. Yeah. And th then we had another one here from Ryan. He says, um, does Dr. Scott have any feedback to justify the cost of, uh, what's this, magnesium l Thuronate, three, three and eight, three and yeah, eight it, versus others. Yeah, it's you have to look at the. So I don't know the, fa the the what's he's what he'd be paying for one versus the other, okay. and why he's using the magnesium. So mm, okay, you know what doses he feels like he needs or what effect he's looking for. If you're just looking for you know to maintain magnesium levels, um, you know you might be you might get plenty from your multivitamin. Okay, if he's looking to use it to like help with sleep, for instance. Yeah. Um, it's a cofactor for uh, lot, oh, a shitload of enzymes. Actually, magnesium is is a cofactor. All it's it's really kind of an under recognized mineral in that sense. But it's it's like the mag mag zinc combination is in lots of sleep formulas. Yeah. Um, because magnesium, the idea is magnesium is a cofactor for catecholomethyltransferase, which is the enzyme in the brain that breaks down dopamine. Which is one of the catacombs. Oh yeah, I knew it sounded familiar. Okay, yeah. Yeah, C O M T. Yes, so yeah. We just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So people actually, we were talking about placebo. That's one of the, um, that's one of the main. Uh, there's a couple studies at least have found that your your genotype for C O M T, which is going to dictate how fast you break down dopamine and therefore how the levels of dopamine that you maintain in your brain yeah, yeah. Um, is predictive of your amenability to a placebo effect. Huh. So okay. people's perceptions of situations change depend on the level of excitability that they have. That makes total so, sense. Yeah, yeah. Like, like some memories you have, like when like people can remember like details of accidents and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. either like they completely dissociate, you know, because they're just, they're like in shock and they're stressed out. Yeah. Um, or, or they like have like this absolutely vivid memory of these like really exciting situations, yeah. you know, or something that was at least arousing in some way, shape or form. Yeah. So, um, it seems like that people who have a, the slower isoform of COMT, um, tend to have higher, uh, likelihood of having a placebo have an effect hmm. okay. because they're given something and they just, they're more excitable and you have like, you get something like. You're just you're getting something like what is this? I don't know what, what it's going to do. Yeah. Ooh, you know, so they get excited, and then that will change their perception of what they're getting hmm. in a way that would tend to make them think they're going to have it. So magnesium is involved with COMT. If you're you want COMT to be able to be fully function to break down dopamine levels when you're trying to sleep, okay. you don't want to be riled up and excited. Okay, so that would be the reason why. So if he's I don't know what the I haven't honestly because he's just I don't know if the three and eight is helping with absorption and or maybe making it time released mm. in a way, but if he's using it for sleep, he could just compare like break it down to what happens for him. There you go. One mm. versus the other. Yeah. You know, 
his sleep is so complex. Yeah. There's so many things, you know, adenosine levels and neurotransmitter levels. You can, you know, attack it with 5-HTP and deal with, with um, serotonin. Then there's magnesium, which is kind of dealing with dopamine. Um, like caffeine is not your friend right. when it comes to sleeping because of the adenosine receptor. Um, so uh, that's why a lot of good sleep formulas have like a time-release melatonin, too. That can help. So you have to know like why he's using this. And um, if he's talking about like literally you can find powdered stuff really cheap. Like Amazon has a bunch. Okay. Oh, Transomnia. Yeah. <laughs> just said. Yeah. So you'd have to uh, try the other version and report back. Okay. There you go. That's a good, that's a, that's what I would say, Ryan. Yeah. see, Because it could be your, your Transomnia, obviously trend is what you think is, is causing it, but. It could be, you know, that the trend is just sort of exa- exacerbating whatever tendencies for insomnia you may already have, hmm. and it may be because of um, maybe because of the dopamine, which is what you know. Yeah. There's a good. He probably heard this. Um, Doctor Dean St. Mark did a Who Adds podcast. Yeah, you know what? Too, I have. I, we did that before, uh, and I, I was just about to say. I so I recorded with Doctor Dean few times we talked about that twice one okay. of them was on the old network uh, on the advices radio youtube page for anybody who's listening to this we have the and you didn't know we have the think big bodybuilding media so we did a like a 30 minute segment about this i'm gonna i'll have to re-release i'll have to release that because i haven't released it yet but i was yeah. gonna say dr dean has a supplement that is fan supplement needs. supplement needs i'll put a link and we have a code actually uh advices now there we have an affiliate code with them. You can get a ten percent discount. It's actually advice is ten, I think. I'll put the code in our in our description for the show. Um, but I'll tell you what. So that product works amazing, Scott. Like the, I have never used a sleep st- supplement that works like that does, and it helps you to clear the dopamine, so that you can you can get better quality rest. I mean that that's just one of the mechanisms. But that's where I first learned about what COMT was. Was listening to Doctor Dean. Uh, having a conversation with him. Well, I'm just, let me Google it here. Um, can you get this? It's, it's a UK based company. Can you get it in? Um, you US can, and he has Amazon? like a flat rate. Sh- no, not through Amazon. You have to go through, I believe it's supplementneeds.com. Um, I believe that's the only way. And he has he set up like a flat rate shipping now, so you can order you know several pocket products if you wanted to to try to you know maximize. But it, that's a great one. They're the the um, the sleep product. And I'm a big fan of their liver product too. Their liver health product is fantastic. It has eight mil, 800 milligrams of Tutka in it. If you take the, the Ooh, full serving, okay. I mean it's yeah. it's like a powerhouse. There's there's nothing else like that on the market. And we've had this so code yeah, set he's up. He's got vitamin B6, P5P, P, which is pyridoxal 5 phosphate, which is vitamin B6, I believe. Yeah, he's got zinc methionine in his. Okay. So um, that may not, you know, uh, Ryan, if you get a hold of some of the like I've always I've heard that about all of. All of uh, Dr. Dean stuff. Yeah, it's good, good stuff. It's yeah, it's honestly like I said, man. I wake up feeling like happy, if that makes sense. Like I literally, I wake up and it's like there's there's a bluebird chirping on my shoulder, and and the, the sun's the sun has a smile on its face, yeah. and, you know. Right. Uh, Whistle while we work, you know. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> uh, let's see. Usually you're a grouch in the morning, Scott. I wake up and try to get a little frisky with you, and you're just like, <laughs> like no, leave me alone, don't touch me. I just like so many of the, the don't touch me days. I need my oh. coffee, you know. I know exactly. Let me get you some coffee, maybe I can get in and wake up. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's this here from Travis James? He asks, um, let's see. Hey guys, um, love to hear your views. On, oh yeah, he and I just talked about this on uh, DM. Hi, hematocrit. Uh, while platelets are within range, low end of normal. Would donating blood be a good option at this point? I've heard it's only really a concern if platelets are high with RBCs. Um, I, I well, just if you're looking kind of strictly at um, clotting potential mm-hmm. in a certain way, yes. But you're also increasing the viscosity of the blood. Yeah. So you're gonna your heart's gonna have to pump a little bit harder there. And if that does in any way, you know, slow the um, the speed at which the blood is moving, you know, 
p- blood that's sort of stagnating or pooling mm. is not good in terms of clot risk. That's okay. why a lot of times people like the common, the th- I mean, I don't know if this happened or not, but you know, John and I wondered if maybe because he spends a lot of time with his computer, John Meadows, who had a, had a heart attack recently, if maybe he had um, a deep vein thrombosis, so a venous thrombus that um, dislodged, so he had one like in his lower leg, which is where people typically can get them, and then became an embolus that made it to his heart, and he had a myocardial infarction. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, you just, uh, like, that's just a really high hematic. That in and of itself, I believe, is a risk factor yeah. for for having um, like a, a stroke or, or a, yeah, a cardiovascular or a cerebrovascular yeah. event. So, yeah, I would, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't just say, well, my playlists are good. Um, because you, I mean, who John doesn't quite know. I don't think why this, this happened to him in particular, but he had, you know, his coronary, um, it's, this isn't everything, but he had a, a calcium score that was like, you know, top notch. Right. And everything else seemed to be good. And I think if you ask, like, for instance, if you were asked John, if he had a hematocrit right now of 59, what would he do about it? He probably would do some, he'd probably try to end that, you know, blood right. like that or figure out why. I mean, I presume this is probably, I'm guessing this is an anabolic, not insinuate anything, Travis, but if this is anabolics related, then, you know, you probably want to address that. I, yeah. Having spoke to him on DM, I'll, I'll just say it's safe to, we, you're safe in assuming. <laughs> yeah. That's just really high. Like, like, um, you know, there's, there's been the, the, the thing that people, and I presume this is from EPO use and sometimes, uh, you know, um, uh, blood doping using their own blood. Yeah. Cyclists have done this. Yeah. So there's a trade off. Um, one of the things that seems to limit cycling performance is red blood cell count. So, uh, some of that is probably not only the ability to deliver more oxygen um if you look i won't get into all this but if you look at like uh, if you can make measurements of maximal blood flow and skeletal muscle yeah and when you compare that to um what you can get in during whole body exercise or like cycling is not quite whole body but it's pretty close you know a lot of muscle mass involved it's only you can only get about one third of the blood flow because the heart is the limiter in terms of providing blood and oxygen. Wow. So for yeah, so there's that so that's there's a there's a central limitation to blood flow huh. um, distribution of skeletal muscle. So the like pump. you do like a one legged leg, leg extension, yeah. Your heart can deliver plenty of blood and you can get plenty of uh, vasodilation in the arterial the arteries and arterioles yeah. to make that happen. But you start doing whole body stuff, and then you've got a limitation. Your heart can't pump as much, but you can deliver more oxygen if you have a higher red blood cell count. Uh, yeah, okay. And, yeah, but there's a trade-off. Like, the higher the, that gets, the more viscous the blood is, and then that then that also taxes the heart. So you would have to kind of optimize those things for performance. Yeah. And cyclists, like triathletes, um, are pretty – cyclists do all sorts of crazy shit. Like, you know, the Lance Armstrong thing people kind of know, but – Triathletes are extreme athletes. They'll do all sorts of crazy stuff. Bodybuilders, of course, too. But cyclists do all that sort of thing. So there's been a number of cases of cyclists who've died from yeah. heart attacks. Um, when they've and they when they've looked at their hematocrit, it was like up in the 60s, yeah. which is really high, like 65. But 59 is pretty it's pretty high. You're getting up there, and these people would have heart attacks while they're exercising. And your risk in in general, your risk of having a heart attack um, goes up when you exercise. Mm. If you're if you're trained and you're healthy, like the the more act, active you are, generally speaking, that just lowers your overall risk of a heart attack. Hmm. So, like if you looked at like the relative risk, let's say one is the average person, and you look at your relative risk of having a heart attack over a 24 hour day, and you exercise for an hour, like your relative risk might for that one hour might be three, okay, or something like that. I don't know the exact numbers, but I can't recall them at least. But during the rest of the day, um, when you're not exercising, it's it's for the other 23 hours, it's 0.5. Yeah. Okay. So you average that out and you're, you know, it's like 0.55 is your average relative risk because of your level of training, All right. your, extra, your, your level of activity. So um, probably just thinking about cardiodynamics, if you've now increased your vat, the viscosity of your blood with that hematocrit, thinking about these cyclists too, you've got a relative risk of having a heart attack while you're exercising that's elevated just without any elevation and 
red blood cell count, and hematocrit. And now you've just sort of amplified that because you've got this increased viscosity, mm. even if your platelets are in, in place. I don't think John had any platelet issues, for instance, yeah. not to keep evoking John, but you can sort of think, like, what would John do? <laughs> it's a good thing. And John's a very health-conscious guy. He had everything lined up, and still shit happens. Yeah. So I would, I would like, think of it maybe from that perspective and say, yeah, I probably should – probably should take care of that and get that back down you I'll, never know i'll tell you what um after having so having done it for the first time in my life i felt a lot better after like immediately first day after my mm -hmm. pumps were terrible okay. but <laughs> two three days after that i was back to normal and i'll tell you what man i just felt so much less so much less like pressure you know mm. pressure in my head and I was more prone to headaches before that. And mine was only a couple points above normal. I was like, uh, yeah. can't remember what it was now, but it was like 51 maybe or something. It was like three yeah. points above, two or three points above range. But I, yeah. I could see, I, I could feel a physical difference uh, just overall. So, I mean, I'd highly, right. highly suggest it if he's that yeah. high, you know. Yeah. The red blood cells, I mean, they're also involved with hemoglobin as a buffer in the blood too. Okay. So... Um, they're involved with there, there's some in uh, there, like the carbonic anhydrase enzyme is contained in the red blood cells and that's involved with the, the bicarbonate buffering system okay. so you have better ability to buffer lactic acidosis brought on by exercise oh so, so there's a performance effect from from that okay so that's why like there are bodybuilders who use just epo okay is that why eq is known as being a, to help your help your stamina yeah huh. that's why they give it to horses Okay. So it's, a, it's a horse steroid, yeah, but they give it like a horse. Like, I, I mentioned this, I think, all the podcasts were together. So yeah. It's like, I remember nice you saying this. Yeah, you mentioned this on, on yeah. drugs and stuff, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, exactly. That was that was the one, right? <laughs> That'll keep me straight, man. But Alzheimer's is, pick, is picking up really fast, early <laughs> onset dementia. Um, but, yeah, like the horse, the horse performance people just go bonkers with all this stuff. And they give, like, they inject buffers and... You know, they give things that increase, like like B6, I think, or B12, you know, all sorts of stuff to try to promote hemato hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis or erythropoiesis. Hmm. So, yeah, buffering is really important for performance. So that's, you know, you'll, you'll notice you might lose, lose a little little loss of stamina, loss of pump, that kind of thing. But, you know, you want to you live to train another day as well. So there's a, there's the trade off. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back to um, Juan's question he asked earlier when he was asking about Jordan, because he also did ask, he said, um, are, are there any other names besides guys like Dante Trudell and Mike Menser that you would uh, uh, you would throw in there with people who do this type of high intensity training we were talking about that we could we could look to to learn from? I mean, Arthur Jones stuff is kind of worth reading. I mean, okay. it's somewhat commercialized, like he's kind of like the one of the early guys. Um, God, I'm trying to think um, who's sort of on that end. What, um, Your Titan guy. Would, is he, would yeah, he be? Yeah, Leo Costa. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what has happened to him, to be honest. Okay. Um, but yeah, his well, his his stuff, a lot of it was pretty high volume. Oh, okay. To like, yeah, so he had like his big program was um, Big Beyond Belief. Okay. I only and know was, about it through you, from you talking yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. And so I looked, um, I had, compete, I was looking to just like try to develop, you know, come up with some new things yeah. and just trying to still learn, you know, experiment. So I looked, the Big Beyond Belief has kind of like a cult following. People would do that. And that's like a, there's a couple, there's another version of that, I think. Maybe he came out with two versions of the system, but the Big Beyond Belief is a pretty, it's a pretty high volume. Okay. Six day a week type okay. training program and i've looked at that and i'm like there's just no way you know i'm just not going to be able to do that i would have to um have to like not train to failure in order to do that number that many sets yeah okay well in that case then that's not our yeah. guy then so but there's you know like one of the things that that he like yeah he has there's some things to learn from everyone you know dig into it i'm trying to think because um any other big names that do this sort of stuff that people would want to look into there's just so much with Dante intense yeah. muscle, you know, just go and dig that, dig through that. Yeah. Um, Dorian. Yeah. There. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. You know, digging on Dorian. He's like the, you know, the, 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 the primary example, I guess that Marcus Ryan Reinhardt guy has got um, some videos out. I don't know if he just sort of vanished from the scene. Hmm. Um, I get the, I, there are people that do this sort of thing who just, 
who just train their clients that way. Mm. I've you know come across trainers over the years. There's there is a guy, um, Ellington Darden. If you want to look into him, Ellington Darden. You can look look into his stuff. I think he's kind of an HIT sort of guy. Okay. Um, and there's some, there's another guy that, whose name I'm blanking on. I can't. But there, who's an HIT guy who has done some uh, done some videos and there's some seminars you can find. Okay. So I get some good yeah. insights, some good resources. Yeah, yeah. There's there's tons of stuff. You just keep digging, man. There's so many rabbit holes. Just uh, keep it all in you know in, in context. All right. Well, that's all we got, Scott. That's a good. Uh, right. I think we I think we we put out oh, a lot. Was Trevor Smith? Yeah. Juan mentioned Trevor Smith. Oh. Yeah. God. Yes. Trevor Smith. See. See. He did a thing with um, Matt. What was Matt's name? It was an IFBB pro who's now passed on. So tre- was it? What was Trevor Smith's training plan called? I'm going to look it up now. I need to know this. Um, Smith. Yeah. <laughs> but, Did he pass away, Trevor Smith? Yeah, he's dead too. Is he with n- yeah. n- nuclear? He was, nuclear Nutrition yeah. was the name of his company. Yeah. He had a great um, demon training is what he called it. Huh. And his stuff was, um, oh, he's got, there's some videos out here I haven't seen. I might have to check this out, but. His stuff was, um, oh, his was oh, beyond failure training. Cause that's what I, yeah, that's, that's his training system. Okay. And his Matt Duvall. I've just, I've just Oh, that. Matt Duvall. Wow. Yeah. That's who he did that with. I think so, Matt Duvall Matt, was out of Michigan. Could, yeah. I think, I think yeah. he could have, I lived in North Carolina, I think for a while, but I think he was like originally. It, yeah. 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 Trevor was over 400 pounds. I saw him at the Olympia or the USA's, I think. Hmm. Once he's just giant, just huge guy. Yeah. He um, but he yeah he passed on. I think he had a heart attack in his kitchen, something like that. At you know, thirty three. Thirty three. Yeah, thirty three. Two thousand. Oh shit! Wow, yeah, he's big man. But yeah, his stuff and and I remember reading about that. His stuff was like you know quintuple drop sets. Yeah. Just like you know crazy, just absolutely decimate the muscle, hmm. which probably for a lot of guys. Unless you like your bodybuilding, your life is bodybuilding twenty four seven. Yeah, you no, know, you just you never, wouldn't be able to recover from that. I'm thinking, but yeah, he was really that was probably even too much. Wow. See that that's the thing is like get the most from the least. If you're training in a certain mm. way, like like you have had a very sort of a slow logical transition from what you were once doing to what you're currently doing. Right. You know, and you made you did some good experiments like with your back training that kind of stuff, but. You didn't like go from like, you know, trying to do 15 to 20 sets for a muscle group, leaving several reps in the tank every time to all of a sudden I'm going to do one all out, you know, eight stage drop set no. like every three weeks. No, <laughs> you know, like it was a natural just, progression. Like, yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. So think about like, what can you take from that idea? Like what maybe am I lacking? You know, would mm. I be better off doing like eight really high quality sets yeah. as hard as I possibly can as opposed to like, you know fluffing around am i am i sandbagging when i'm trying to do 20 sets am i are those really good yeah there's a lot of that just junk volume you know so um but yeah the beyond failure training from what i recall that was like that was like um like kind of like cybergenics style shit oh really okay yeah and and i've talked the cybergenics was just you know quintuple drop sets positive and negative failure i'm looking at trevor smith now and I'm shocked at how big he was. You said he got to 400 pounds. Now, granted, Dave Palumbo was in contest shape, but I'm looking at a picture of him next to Dave Palumbo, making Dave look like like a middleweight bodybuilder or something. Yeah, here's a picture of him next to Ronnie. I've got that Ronnie one too. Ronnie's biggest. Yeah, I'll put that one up too. He looks, yeah, he looks like bigger than Ronnie, basically. Well, yeah, a little bit taller, but you know, yeah. and doesn't have Ronnie's structure. Right, they're both in shirts, so there's that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, he was a he was a big dude, man. Beyond failure training, and that's what it was. Like, here's one of him next. Oh my god, there's one next to Dorian. It may have been like after Dorian had retired. Okay. And he looks like he's a little downsized, and Trevor's like faxed out, and, he, and Dorian <laughs> looks like his little brother. I got one up next to Jay, and he's like, you know, he looks like Jay's taller brother, you know. Yeah, and look how big his arm, like Jay's arm is. <laughs> the both arms are crazy, but yeah, he had to have like 23 inch arms. Oh yeah. Yeah, it looks like it was, a crazy wear shirt, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yep. yeah, he, yeah, he, yeah, he wore all the stuff. <laughs> yep. 
That's a trip. Yeah, and there was one with his wife. I, I remember like after like he he passed and like his wife like tried to like take care of his business and stuff and yeah. And I think she sold off some of the like a lot of supplements they had. But okay. Yeah. He, so his his training was there's some like um some like sort of blog type post stories of like what the training like someone kind of taking you through the training. Okay. You know, and all the anxiety that le- le- leads up Ooh, to it. Yeah. Everything like like when you know what you're going to do, it's like this is Every workout's going to be like one of the most diabolically difficult things that you've ever experienced, and that's the idea. Yeah, it's like you're going to like it's going to be a like a death-defying level of pain. Yeah, you know, and suffering. And it's going to it's not going to be over and done. It's not like you got a couple reps, you know, that are really tough, and then mm. the set's over. Yeah, you're fucking, you know, you're dying, you know. So, um, but you know, I do those. I got I was in a uh, a, a drop set kick there for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I posted some of those up on, on Instagram and I was doing like, I would do like, I just did this the other week cause I was kind of in a hurry and I did like a, a rack dead, I think with, with six plates. Okay. And then I did a bent over row with four plates and then I did, and then I did, went, went to four Oh five and then three sixty five and three fifteen and two seventy five and two and a quarter Oof. of bent over rows. So Oof. it was like, what is that? Like six, yeah. something like that. My, those, I like those. Those are those are fun. My lower back would be screaming at me, but I I could imagine what you got out of that. Oh, there! I I I wish I could train that way all the time. I would. I just can't get away with it. It doesn't help me progress. And I just I get so sore afterwards. I okay. just can't do. But I can only do like one of those. Like I might do like a pull yeah. down, like rest pause set. Now I'm doing. I'm I've gone back to regular formal fortitude training, but this is when I was doing a lot of traveling and things were kind of messed up with the pandemic, et cetera. So, yeah. but I was down South at the gym. I train in smash fitness is in Benita Springs. It's called smash. I like that. Um, yeah. Good. Really good gym actually. Um, and I like, I like training down there. So I'm just like, I'm going to have some, I did a rack through the rack pool and then just whatever that is. And it's, I love training that way. And it's, like the thing is there's something to say for like taking some of these things and doing them now and again, mm-hmm. not in excess. You still want to be able to recover. And then when you go back to regular training, it seems relatively so easy and you recognize mm. I've just got this one set. Yeah. What, you know, what, have, what can I put into this one set? Um, because there's no drop set. There's no, like, I'm not thinking, okay, I gotta, I gotta survive the four or five and the three sixty five and the three fifteen and the two seventy five and the two and a quarter. Right. So you leave a little bit maybe cause you know, you're going to like the whole set is going to be so di- diabolical. If you're at 95%, you're still going to get a lot out of it and maybe too much anyway. Yeah. And then, then when you go back to just doing a straight set, you're like, I got, I'm done in, you know, 10 seconds. I'm going to just destroy this shit. Yeah. And you get that from doing like stuff like a beyond failure type of training or like some of like a John Meadows challenge that everything becomes relatively hmm. less difficult in a, in psychologically speaking. So then you recognize to what extent you have been maybe sandbagging a little bit. Mm. Even if it's not, you know, you're not clearly saying like noticing your, in your mind that like, Oh, I'm kind of broken. I'm stopping this set. And you're like, you're like, fuck, I should, I should have got another one. Like yeah. you're not kicking yourself because you know, you gave up. Right. But you recognize that there's something that might you might not have been doing that you could have been doing. Hmm. Um, and that comes from from trying some of these things where it's really, really hard. So I, I, I'm big on the experimentation, you know, and and see you know, who knows beyond failure training is friggin ridiculous. No one's doing it. <laughs> yeah. You know that I know of. I don't like it's not like a, a going training style, but some people people just won't do D.C. training either because they don't want to train that way. It's not fun for them no. anymore. Yeah. You can't like talk to people in between and you, you have to like, <laughs> yeah, you have to be like really totally single minded and, and uncomfortable going into some serious discomfort in some of those. Yeah. Sets. yeah. You have to thrive on that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's get out of here, guys. Thanks for everybody tuning in here at the live feed. Uh, guys, if you haven't subscribed yet at the YouTube page, why don't you? Why don't you do it? We have several podcasts coming <laughs> out each week. Ya. And of course, uh, speaking of training programs, check out fortitudetraining.net for Scott's ebook. It's only like 20 bucks. So pick it up, check it out. Great program. And of course, byobbcoach.com. That's where you can pick up Scott's ebook for the Be Your Own Bodybuilding Coach book. We'll also have the uh, Amazon affiliate link if you want to check out the hardcover. Uh, and of course, go to our sponsors, truenutrition.com and getazleth.com. Dr. Scott, I hope you have a great workout today. Thanks, brother. Yeah, enjoy your off day. See you guys. Thanks for the questions. The questions were great. Appreciate it.